Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Sickle and Hammer Time. Today we are joined, as always, by Peter Rhodes, but also by Sabrina Bellina for the second time, although technically the first time on this show, but in the continuity of the 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 um the Marvel Universe. What was it called? <laughs> the podcast uh, extended podcast universe? Uh, it's uh, the second time. I, b- I believe it's the uh, Azure Scapegoat Cinematic Universe. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's those are the words I was looking for. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good evening. Oh, as good evening. Year, uh, or um, good afternoon, or whatever, whatever time it is when you're listening to this. Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa. <laughs> Merry Christmas, if you're l- listening to this Christmas of 2020. <laughs> so, Sabrina, who uh, who are you? Why are you here? What what gives you the right? <laughs> What gives me the right? Well, I guess I kind of have to, got to take your own rights at this point. Um, at least if we're talking about um, American politics, which I have a few opinions on. Um, I am an American. Really, I, I didn't know that you were political at all. No, no, my my Twitter is all memes and shit posts. No signs of politics <laughs> anywhere on there at all. I try to be very apolitical. You know, very yeah, brand friendly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I got the um I got the impression that you were actually a bit of a centrist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now this is funny. I, I can't maintain this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes you will vote Republican, sometimes you vote Democrat, you know, you don't go too far in either direction. Fiscal conservative, progressive. Fiscal like, conservative, yeah. <laughs> Fiscal conservative. <laughs> Yeah, you like you like weed, but you hate poor people. Exactly. Yeah. You know, the spectrum is more like a horseshoe. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So last time you were on, Sabrina. Mm-hmm. Uh, hi, Sabrina, by the way. Uh, oh. Last time you were on, you talked about um, working for the Bernie campaign or being interested in perhaps working for the, the Bernie 2020 campaign. And there's a lot going on at the moment. Uh, we're kind of following from the sidelines, obviously as people from outside the U.S., but I w- we're very curious to hear about like your take on what's going on at the moment in the American election. Right. So I have um, been volunteering for the Bernie campaign. Unfortunately, um, I've been you know busy with my own work and my own um, uh, projects lately, so it, I haven't been able to be as involved as I would have liked. Um, but, mm. but that's all right. I try, which is... Um, why lately i've been able to do some phone banking for the bernie sanders campaign which has been phenomenal um last election cycle in 2016 i also did phone banking for bernie sanders and a lot of the times um a lot of people wouldn't know who he is which was you know kind of kind of disappointing or if they did know they didn't care for him but this time around out of all the calls that I'm making, most people not only know who Bernie Sanders is, but they support him. And the people who really support him are just so excited. And, you know, they definitely <laughs> tell me how they feel about some other candidates. But the <laughs> excitement is there. And I'm so excited because it's there in big numbers. Yeah. That's I so cool. I heard yeah. on, um, I believe it was on, on Bernie's uh, Twitter page. He said that they raised, was it $4 million in the last 20 days? Oh, dude, yeah. And actually, in the last, um, I think it's the last two days, we had Whoa. a very exciting uh, debate a few uh, nights ago. It was, it's, it, blah, blah. We had a very exciting debate a couple nights ago. It's the last Democratic debate before the first uh, primary vote, which is going to be the Iowa caucus in February. Mm. And so um, most of it was pretty tame. There were a few um, highlight moments uh, for Bernie and and Warren because I I don't know if you guys have been following this part. It's a little bit more (laughs) drama than it is uh, politics. But supposedly a couple of years ago, uh, there was a conversation between Bernie and Warren where Warren is saying that Bernie said that he thought a wooden a woman could not be president, which is completely <laughs> unlike Bernie. And hashtag I trust Bernie on this. <laughs> yeah, I mean it. It does sound very uncharacteristic for him to say that. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, just considering the fact that he has been like way before his time, like 30, 40 years ago, like ever since he's, he started being involved in politics, he's been 
before his time on race uh, during the civil rights movement and before his time on gay and trans people and women and abortion rights and, I mean, e fiscally, economically, socially, on every policy he's been way before his time. Uh, and and, and uh, suddenly, two years ago, he was like, those broads, I don't know <laughs> if they can hold political office. I don't think women should have the right to vote. Like, yeah. really? That's, that's so unlike him. And then honestly, the thing that initially got me into Bernie Sanders back in uh, 2015 was a story about him driving a bus of uh, breast cancer patients to Canada to get um, medication for a tenth of the cost it was in the U.S. So I know that he's always been a champion on uh, women's rights, especially. So to hear this story come out conveniently two years later, right before the uh, Iowa caucus, as Warren's yeah. numbers start to drop in the polls, it's just, it's a little too convenient. Yeah, I was going to say that's very convenient that it comes out now right she's been she's been listening too much uh to her uh hillary staffers i think <laughs> honestly i think that is a big part of it because this whole collaboration of hers with cnn it just it's a page right out of the hillary playbook yeah i read somewhere that she has actually hired a bunch of the people from the hillary 2016 campaign to work on her strategy and stuff so that that kind of scream it it because the whole thing kind of screams to me like something Hillary would have done in the 2016 election if it had been this close yeah, like looking totally. for compromising information or and, like and trying to split his and vote. Didn't or she something. also during the debate bring out the "I'm going to be the first female president" card? Kind of, yeah. She yeah. she she spoke up this thing about how uh, she was electable and so was Amy Klobuchar because they were the only ones that hadn't lost elections since what was it 1990 mm. or something, which is a very strange uh argument i think yeah that uh, uh, that one didn't make as much sense also bernie won his election uh 29 years ago so it, it was just weird that she was so concerned with the math uh for that weird moment <laughs> during the debate it's like what are you saying what is your message i think it was yeah. a very misguided uh uh f like female empowerment statement of yeah. some sort she was going for yeah mm. Which is like cool and all, but like it's 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 a strange way of of doing it. Like it's a strange tactic to go from like this accusation against Bernie and then launching straight into women. Yeah, yeah. I'm I, like I'm pretty afraid that if Warren were to win, that she would like I don't know which of her policies she's willing to like give up on. Like as soon as as soon as there's pressure from Congress or from her advisors or whatever. Like, I don't know when, where, on which policy she's going to buckle. And, like, she can talk, she talks about a whole bunch of things, but, like, she goes back on them later. No, absolutely. And, like, she regrets and she goes back and, like, on Medicare, she went back. Yep. I remember. And she's already, you know, bending over for centrists just during the primary. In general, she already said that it is okay for her to accept, you know, uh, big money special interests. So already we see her campaign run. She's gravitating towards the right. And I feel like if she's, you know, if she is elected president, that we're going to see her pulled even more to the right. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, if we could just take a step back, I'm kind of curious. You mentioned you were uh, phone banking for, mm -hmm. for Bernie. So, uh Correct me if I'm wrong, that means that you're, you're calling people in the districts where they're going to be voting soon, right? Yes. So even though I'm based out of California, um, depending on like time zones and maybe what election is coming up soon, um, they had us phone banking for like various states, um, depending on like when voters have to be registered by a certain date. So like I made some calls in Iowa, New mm -hmm. Hampshire and California, of course, um, which California actually recently changed its law. And now voters are able to uh, register as Democrats at the polls same day so that they can receive an actual ballot instead of a provisional ballot, which can be thrown away if the party wants it to be. Oh, wow. That's, that's cool. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so uh, I, I guess a follow-up question. Like, sure. do, uh, do you get like, um, do you get prepared statements or like things that you have to mention or th or do you do, are you able to, to to say whatever you want or is there a certain thing that the bernie campaign would like you to say during the calls so 
in terms of like scripts for phone bankers, um, it's very much not what was supposedly leaked about uh, that other dumb drama about Bernie Warren recently where it said, oh, if if you like Warren, well, she's my second choice and and something, whatever, whatever the issue was. Um, I haven't heard about that. Was that a thing? Yeah. Let me see if I can hmm. um, pull it up. Yes. And supposedly it even came from Warren's campaign about um this phone banker script and that they wanted Bernie to apologize for um, Bernie. I honest, I honestly had no idea. I, uh, I, I'm asking because I had some friends who went uh, to the U S in 2016 to campaign for Hillary and they were given very like tight scripts on what to say if they talked to potential voters. And they were told very strictly, which was interesting to me not to talk about policies, but to only talk about how dumb Donald Trump was <laughs> or how it was exciting that there was going to be a female president and all these talking points that they were supposed to like stick very like strictly to. And I was just curious to see how or hear from you if, if the like how the Bernie campaign handles that, because I have a like I have an impression that that Bernie's much more like grassrooty, much more you do your yeah. thing kind of way of doing politics. But I, I could be wrong. I don't know. I don't know how phone banking works. I don't think that's a thing really in Europe. I mean, that no, sounds very Hillary. Really, it's not. Oh, well. No. Yeah, American elections are weird. I'm, I'm sure you guys are <laughs> way ahead of us. Um, I don't know if it's just like parties here choose not to do it or if it's like if our laws count it as like telemarketing. Oh, well, yeah, I have no which idea. isn't really strictly allowed here either. That that makes sense because I think the tools that are used for phone banking, it is kind of similar to to an auto dialer. It's not like you're going to get a robot. Mm. You're definitely going to get um, a, a volunteer. Um, but there is like some auto dialing, but it's, um, the numbers that are mm. called are not just, you know, randos across the country. I think it's, um, people who have either expressed interest in the Bernie Sanders campaign by like signing up or donating, or I think they also have access to people who are registered Democrats. Um, mm. so it's not like they're just calling random people. Um, but in terms of going back to, uh, this issue somewhat recently um and i'm just going to read this headline where it says scoop bernie stealthily goes negative on warren with a volunteer script to tell warren leaning voters that she only appeals to the affluent highly educated oh yeah i did see that yeah, yeah. and the thing is for normal phone bankers this is very much not the case when you're phone banking you know you log in and it's it's line by line in terms of like, you know, introducing yourself, introducing that you volunteer for the Bernie campaign, ask, you know, say hello. And then you're asking people um, like if they're going to vote and who they're currently planning on voting for. But that's pretty much it. And, and or if they are Bernie Sanders volunteers. The main goal when I was uh, phone banking was to try to recruit more Bernie people uh, for volunteering purposes. Um, we weren't trying to sway people from, you know, other candidates if they did express interest in, in other people. If, you know, volunteers did choose to share, oh, yeah, I like Warren. She's my second choice. Then that's usually on them. If anything, we just ask who they're going to vote for. Is it Bernie? Can you volunteer? If it's not Bernie, it's, oh, why do you like this person? Thanks for your information. This is your election date. That's, that's it. It's, it was just this big drama that kind of blew up and kind of it, it, that event seemed to spark some more tension in the Warren-Bernie camps in the last few weeks. So that's it. <laughs> That's that's so that's so fascinating. I have so many questions about <laughs> phone banking. Now. Sure. Um, when when yeah. I have like it's a, a very bit of a specific foreign concept for us, I think. Yeah. No. It's 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 very interesting, and it reminds me of uh, of those. I, I had a telemarketing job in the past before, oh. which was a nightmare. But I was just curious. Yeah. You're calling people in Iowa, which is the upcoming caucus, as you mentioned, the first kind of test of the candidates to see how well they're doing and resonating with voters. Right. And I was just curious, like. How many people would you estimate if you called, like, how many people out of 10 would you say, I don't even know if you're allowed to share this information, but, like, a rough overview of how many people do you think support someone like 
um, Biden, who seems to be leading at the moment in, in like the average of the polls. Let's see. Well, because here's the thing, especially the I don't know if I can say like out of 10, but the majority of the people, if they did have a preference, a lot of people just said, you know, I'm, I'm undecided. But if they did have a preference, the most common name that I heard was Bernie Sanders. Um, probably the second common was Warren. I did not hear a lot of Biden. I did not hear a lot of uh, Pete. I heard a couple Andrew Yangs. I heard that. But the thing is, like, mm. also with phone banking, a lot of the people just straight up don't answer your call. Or as soon as you identify who you are, they hang up on you or they say they're just they're not interested. So you're right. really making, like, a lot of calls in such a short amount of time. Because a lot of the times, like, people are busy and you're calling in the middle of a weekday. Um, mm. They don't want to be talking to you. But, no. but yeah, most, most common name was Bernie's. I did hear that um, that in polls conducted during the weekend, Bernie was leading, but in polls conducted during the weekdays, Warren was leading. See, now that is so <laughs> interesting because yeah. I feel like, you know, Bernie really does represent the the working class. I mean, his top donors work at Amazon. Um, Target, mm -hmm. Walmart, USPS, teachers, and I highly doubt they're, you know, the top of the food chain. So I'm not surprised that, you know, people who are, you know, Bernie Strong are unavailable to take a phone call in the middle of a workday. Yeah, would make sense, I, I think. I did see statistics on, on, like, Warren supporters, and a lot of them are, like, uh, intelligentsia, like <laughs> academics, professors, um, like fairly well off, like upper middle class people, I would say. Exactly. The type of people who would say, but how are you going to pay for that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much. Yeah, they say that in regards to like healthcare and public education, but you know, we never hear how are you going to pay for that when we're talking about possibly, you know, invading another country or, you know, more tax breaks for the ultra wealthy. We never hear, oh, yeah. are you going to pay for that? Yeah, it's funny how that's always the case. All of these, like, when the whole Iran thing was happening, it sort of died down now. People don't really talk about it as much. But while, like, th there was still the possibility that the US was going to, like, invade Iran, a bunch of these, like, neoliberals and conservatives were saying that oh, a war with Iran would be over in, like, two hours because you would just bomb them and then they'd give up. Like, did, did, were you alive during the Iraq war? Like, did, did, were you paying attention in that whole thing? Uh, I, like, the US has been in Afghanistan for, like, 19 years. And Iran is way more militarily powerful absolutely. than both Iraq and Afghanistan. And especially, like, what, Iran is, like, three times larger than Iraq? Like, what are people thinking? Do they think that these countries are just interchangeable and as soon as we get there, everything will be okay? I, I don't know what's going through their head. I also think yeah. that, that a lot of, especially Americans, equate Iran and Iraq sort of mentally, but mm. it, they're so far from each other. Like, Iran has one of the biggest militaries in the world. It's mm -hmm. a very highly developed country. Yeah. And, like, a side note, I was, I was reading a book by uh, the philosopher Roger Scruton, who recently <laughs> passed away. He was a conservative philosopher. And he talks about, and I, I, find, I find it like it's such an interesting distinction. They, conservatives talk about how the problem with uh, socialism and leftism and, and Marxism is that um, it's so easy to, to just want to tear everything down. But, pe but, you know, they don't factor in how long it takes to rebuild something. But then on the other hand, they go out and say, we'll just go into Iraq or Iran or whatever and we'll bomb them and then everything will be fine. Like, th yeah. they only apply that logic to things where uh, it's convenient for them, really. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just look at um, Libya. How, I mean, Libya was bombed into the Stone Age, essentially, um, in order to bring down the terrible dictator Gaddafi. Uh, it really was about oil, but, you know, to bring down the terrible dictator Gaddafi... And now it's like a three-way civil war that's been going on for like a few years. And they have like slave markets, like black market slavery. It's like, wow, that bombing campaign really helped save those people. <laughs> and then the U.S. just kind of pieced out like, all right, our job here is done. I mean, essentially. 
So I've been following the the Iowa polls and the Democratic primary polls in general, mm-hmm. and um, I believe in in Iowa about half or about over half are still undecided. Bernie is at about I think what twenty percent of those who have decided, so twenty percent of the fifty percent. <laughs> Um, That's a good chunk. And he's, yeah, he's leading right now. Pete Buttigieg was leading before him, but he's like dropped off. Warren has, Warren like went up and then she went down again. And Biden is pretty stagnant. Like he doesn't really, Biden goes up, but then he, like Biden goes down, but then he always goes back up again. Mm -hmm. Like his whole, his polling is always a wave. Like whenever, whenever he speaks, he goes down, but then when he's silent, it goes back up again. Yeah, I think Biden's <laughs> Biden's got brain worms. Something's going on there. He his sentences just like aren't very cohesive, especially like when it comes time for debates like those debates, especially if they're on the East Coast, like they're up late. It is well past his bedtime. And and you <laughs> hear it sometimes like yeah. his sentence structure just dissolves. I find it so interesting, though, that like every time there is a debate, his polling go way down like his his support the his the support for him crashes mm-hmm. but for whatever reason it always climbs back up again to the to the same level it used to be like who are these people who support biden even like time after time when he fucks up and says something weird and is like defeated in debates like who are these people who keep supporting him They're i probably... think it's the nixon thing like <laughs> name recognizable things and yeah, people don't really maybe. pay attention to to politics in general maybe what, what do you think sabrina no, no no i i do agree with that totally uh people i know we talk a lot about you know the debate or or polls or, or recent political events but a lot of people at least in the u.s are just so apathetic and they don't follow it nearly as close as we do so sometimes it's hard to remember that we're in an echo chamber and sometimes like mm-hmm. support isn't exactly what what we see and a lot of people will totally just go off of name recognition like yeah. or if anything they're on Facebook and they see oh Biden I mean Biden Bernie and Warren are are spatting again oh that's so much drama we didn't have this mm. with Biden I'm going to choose mm. Biden yeah maybe i um when when the Iran thing was happening on the day of, mm-hmm. um, Biden tweeted something like, uh, "This is a uh, uh, well." He said like, um, "I'm not going to comment on this before we know more." Mm-hmm. When Bernie was immediately like, "No war with Iran." Yeah. But and Biden was like, "Well, I don't, I don't know. We don't know too much. I'm not going to comment on this." And the comments seemed to be almost universally like. Oh wow, a president who thinks before he speaks. Like, is that really how Biden supporters think? Well, like they they like the fact that he is. I don't know. Again, that's such a centrist position where it's like, well, well, let's hear both sides. Yeah, let's hear yeah. the both sides <laughs> when starting a war with you know a, another country that has you know nuclear capabilities. That's mutually assured destruction that's so stupid but yeah let's let's wait till we hear from both sides to condemn war yeah let's not be too drastic here (laughs) (laughs) i liked your tweet about how um what was it about about bernie um bernie saying something rude so therefore you no longer support universal health care like that's the kind of thinking (laughs) (laughs) oddly enough i mean i'm not gonna say that that tweet got me in trouble but it definitely got me um blocked by a few like bigger neo-lib celebrity people um because yeah. like again that's my tweet looks ridiculous i said something about um oh bernie supporters were mean to me online so i don't think the poor should have health care anymore super <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. was just a joke tweet but in essence that is a lot of what I see on on Twitter, you know, like kind of yeah, neo-lib yeah. celebrity uh, figures and they support Warren or Pete or even Biden. Um, and they try to use this this lie that Bernie is is somehow sexist. And because his mm. supporters, you know, who are you know pretty active on Twitter, call out um, accounts that try to paint that. They try to, you know, erase what Bernie's biggest demographic actually is, and they try to paint everybody as a 
as a trolling Bernie bro. And it's like, yeah. okay, I'm I'm not white. I'm not a boy. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen tweets that are like, all of Bernie's supporters are bullies. Uh, they're all like sexists. And I, I don't know. Yeah, just like, just bullies. Like that, that, that Bernie somehow sends out his army of supporters to Twitter and he like tells them like bully people online and like uh, bully women <laughs> like, like be mean to women on Twitter yeah. as if like Bernie would ever say that. So Sab Sabrina, can you can you confirm can you confirm whether or not the um, Sanders campaign <laughs> tells you to bully people in Iowa? <laughs> I promise that the Bernie campaign has not instructed us to bully people online. <laughs> I have not gotten that That's email yet. It might have gone to my spam mm. folder. <laughs> but to be fair, you are biased. I, but you mean biased towards Bernie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, it's almost like you if, like if this Bernie If he had guy. told you to go to go on Twitter and bully people, <laughs> like you would say that he hadn't. To be fair. So to be fair, I'm just I mean, gonna take a centrist approach here and say that I don't know too much. I'm not gonna make a statement. <laughs> Let's hear both sides of the argument. But it's so funny because a lot of these people who are, you know, like uh, still Hillary supporters somehow, or they were Hillary supporters, or maybe they're like Warren mm. stands now. You know, they're so they they claim that you know Bernie is like unleashing his supporters on Twitter to bully them, but. Yeah. You know, I don't think they had anything to say, you know, the last election time around when one of Clinton's uh, super PACs spent like over a million dollars on Internet trolls. I mean, Bernie's raising a lot of money right now, but none of it's going to Internet trolling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Hillary people really are the worst. Like, uh, I'll never forget that one time uh, that I read an article that said that more Hillary supporters in 08 uh, voted for mccain uh than um obama exactly uh, which is mm, which yeah. which just tells you everything you need to know about that part of the democratic establishment i think mm -hmm. yeah there was also a poll that was like um during the 2016 primaries between bernie and hillary mm -hmm. the hillary supporters were asked if um if it came down to bernie or trump would you vote which one would you vote for and i think like 20 percent said trump uh, whereas the Bernie supporters were like 6% would vote Trump. That is just 20% too high. And again, very telling of their <laughs> character. If they're trying to claim that Bernie is sexist versus Donald Trump's blatant grab them by the pussy sexism, come on. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think the thing is that um, Bernie is sexist because he's a socialist and Donald Trump is okay because at least he defends capitalism. I think I think a lot of it comes from the um, the call out thing that we talked about in the in the last episode too. It seems like uh, people people are are hungry in a sense online, um, looking for reasons to dislike someone. In a sense, yeah. like it seems like any flimsy um, accusation you can hang on to immediately becomes proof of sexism or racism or whatever. Especially yeah. when it applies to Bernie. Because you have yeah. all these uh, establishment Democrats that throw money into besmirching like a Bernie's name and character, mm. like any any anyone they could get uh, that has been in contact with Bernie within the last twenty years, if they can find something that they're willing to say which would make him look bad, they're going to report on it. Yeah, I mean, also just like these people who are calling Bernie a sexist now, like it's not like they used to like Bernie, like they. They didn't like Bernie beforehand, and, and so now that they hear this rumor, you know, they latch onto it because it's another reason to hate Bernie, which they already did. Like, it confirms their worldview. I, I totally agree with you. They were not Bernie supporters before, and I think the average Bernie supporter is able to, you know, detect that very quickly. But also what I'm seeing a lot, like on Twitter, for example, in terms of combating those people who try to, you know, claim that Bernie is sexist... <laughs> And it's obviously very trolly behavior, um, mm -hmm. but when somebody says, oh, Bernie's running against a woman, and why is Bernie trying to defeat a woman if he's not sexist? Like, stuff like that. I see a lot of people retorting with, well, why is Warren trying to defeat a Jewish president? That's so anti-Semitic uh, anti of you. And obviously, 
I don't think any Bernie supporters legitimately think that any of the attacks on on uh, Bernie, like on Twitter, well, you know, there's there's probably some, but that's not the people we're engaging with. Um, that these sexist attacks are actually like you know anti-Semitic, but it's just kind. It, it's trying to throw their argument back at them. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. it is ridiculous to try to call her anti-Semitic just because he's a Jewish person. Just like it's ridiculous to call him sexist just because he's running against a woman. Yeah. I've actually heard from some conservative Jewish people that Bernie isn't a quote-unquote real Jew because he's critical of Israel. I don't think... <laughs> I'm, I'm not an expert on this. I'm going to preface that right now. But I don't think criticizing the Israeli government is same as criticizing Jewish people. Yeah, I don't know. It's a it's a stretch. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I mean, I think like conservatives in America are very quick to. Um, we shouldn't talk about Israel too much, but like uh, <laughs> conservatives in America are very quick to as to like that like they want Israel, the state, mm-hmm. to represent all Jewish people like in the world, mm-hmm. and any criticism toward the government of Israel is like an attack on the Jewish race, um, which is really stupid, considering that the ruling party in Israel only has like 20% support, which would mean that 80% of the Jews living in Israel are anti-Semitic. <laughs> but, uh, that is a good point. <laughs> so how are you feeling about Bernie's prospect of, first of all, winning in Iowa, and second of all, winning the primaries as a whole? I do feel very confident that Bernie is not only going to win in Iowa, New Hampshire, especially California, um, but Mm. I think that if it truly is left to voters and just, you know, caucusers, I'm, I'm confident that Bernie will be the nominee. However, I'm very concerned, um, about, you know, the DNC, you know, coming in, tipping the scales again, like, like they've done in the past. I mean, mm. we've seen through all mainstream media already that um, they're very much trying to black out any coverage of Bernie and whatever coverage that is allowed of Bernie, it's either regarding, you know, a supposed scandal or they have to make it seem as if he's, you know, doing bad. Like, it has to be negative. Yeah. Bernie plummets to second place. It's like, <laughs> okay, but he was in fourth before, so can you really call that plummeting? Um, mm. just... It feels like the media has shifted their strategy, because for a long time, when the, when the primaries were starting out, the mainstream media's strategy toward Bernie was to ignore him completely, right. and to pretend like he didn't exist. And they were talking about Biden and mentioning Warren. Like They wanted to ignore Warren also, but then they kind of realized that, no, Warren is like the Hillary of, of this group, so we'll, we'll talk about her. Right. And they talked about Yang, and they talked about uh, Kamala Harris, and, <laughs> and Tulsi, and Cory Booker, and, and everyone. And even when Bernie was in second place, they never mentioned him. Nope. Um, you're, but you're now, so right now about they've that. shifted strategy to just shit-talking him, like yep. going all in heavy artillery, only attacking Bernie. Yeah, I mean, what's that quote? I'm not sure if it actually is by Gandhi or not, where it's like, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. I mean, supposedly it's mm. from Gandhi, but I don't know about that. But either way, I think we're on the stage where they fight you. And yeah. we, we definitely are seeing that because you are right. They, they very much tried to ignore him in the beginning. And, you know, they, they laughed in terms of like a socialist. No, that's not going to win. That'll yeah. never pass. That's ridiculous. They very much try to shrug him off. I mean, they, like, they laughed at Medicare for All, and they laughed at the Green New Deal. And, like, all of the policies which Bernie supported in 2016 have become mainstream now. Like, Absolutely. all of the candidates support. He has moved the conversation left, at the very least, yeah. which is huge. And, yeah. and I actually think that even if Bernie loses the primary, even if Bernie doesn't become president, like, he has still influenced American politics in a very positive way. Absolutely. And... Something that Bernie did that a lot of other uh, candidates won't do is he did go on Fox News during his uh, presidential uh, run. And for the first time in a while, he was allowed to talk about Medicare for all at some length, as opposed to, you know, being on like MSNBC, CNN, etc. 
Um, they yeah. very much shut that down very quickly. <laughs> but when you expose those policy ideas and how you're going to pay for it to people who are, you know, maybe more on the right, they listen mm. and they like it. And that's why, like, as of right now, about 70 percent of Americans do support, you know, a single payer Medicare for all system because everybody's getting screwed by American health care right now. Um, yeah. So he's not only pulling the conversation left, but he's he's pulling it more to what the center should have been. Because right now the American mm. center is just it's very far right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We we are aware. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I think it's interesting because Bernie is actually capable of taking Republican voters mm -hmm. and convincing them that if he were if he it was him against trump right. like actually being able to convince some republicans that they should vote for him whereas people like joe biden they talk about working with republicans but when they really when what they really mean by that is compromising with republicans right and like giving in to the republicans on certain issues allowing the republicans to have influence mm -hmm. whereas bernie isn't moving to the center in order to appeal to republicans he is talking to Republican voters directly, and he's convincing them to vote for him, um, like just by using good arguments and good policies. And it works. Like they find that what he is proposing is not radical at all. It's what every similarly advanced country has. Why can't you know the richest country in the world do that as well? Mm. I think most of the people who voted for Trump were. Just, uh, I mean, it's the whole thing that Trump was anti-establishment and Bernie's also mm -hmm. anti-establishment to a degree. I think a lot of Americans are just kind of sick of politics and the way that it works and how uh, politics seems to move really slowly and the it all seems either corrupt or inefficient mm -hmm. or bureaucratic. And a lot of, I think a lot of Americans just want something to happen mm -hmm. like they want something to change because the current the status quo isn't doing anything for them yeah so that, that's why i think a lot of former trump voters would go over to bernie as opposed to like joe biden because he's very much an establishment politician yeah i think so too i think maybe they see joe biden as you know extension of obama which he kind of is in terms of like you know yeah, like policy sort of. um and you know a lot of them just really didn't like obama um, mm. for whatever their reasons are. Um, but I, I don't know if Republicans will vote for, um, in a general election, if they will vote for, um, Biden or Warren or, or even Pete, highly doubtful for Pete <laughs> over Bernie. Cause at least what they do respect about Bernie, um, what I've noticed across the aisle is that they respect his integrity and his mm -hmm. his commitment to his values that he has his been consistent absolutely consistent yeah. for decades his entire career whether or not they agree with him they 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 can acknowledge that yeah speaking of the the establishment uh sucking um what <laughs> do you what do you think of uh the impeachment uh, thing that's going on. Do you think that's hurting the Democrats as as a as an electable force right now? Do you think that it's it's doing them good? They just recently uh, took it up in the Senate. I don't know if uh, you read yeah. about it. Um, in regards to impeachment, I think this could have been done a lot sooner. I think it's a little silly that you know putting children in cages uh, was not enough to begin this conversation. Um that a Muslim ban was not enough to begin this conversation. These articles of impeachment didn't start until um, Trump went after information in regards to Joe Biden's son working with UK with Ukraine. So once, you know, Biden, you know, a Democratic favorite uh, started becoming the victim of Trump's attacks, all of a sudden we see, you know, care for, for yeah. impeaching him. So Nancy Pelosi, you know, it was really up to her and she could have done this a, a lot sooner, um, which I'm really disappointed in because again, like by the time that these, uh, that this impeachment, whether it really goes through or not, um, in terms of 
uh, what the Senate decides. It's already time to elect a new president. What what yeah. what is that going to do? And if Trump is removed from office now, just hypothetically, it's obviously not going to happen with a Republican Senate. But if he were to be removed from office now, would that even prevent him from running again in 2020? So if Trump is um, real, I mean, if he is fully impeached, I think he can run again. I don't think it fully stops him. Um, hmm. I just want to make sure because I know a lot of people are concerned for that because, again, we're right upon the next election cycle. I don't even know if another Republican is running. I think maybe one. Yeah, one. Well, there were two, but one of them dropped out, so now there's just one. I forget his name. He was some old white dude. <laughs> yeah, I, I think Wayne, he can run again. Probably. But doesn't mm. doesn't this whole impeachment thing? Th that's ki like kind of how I'm thinking about it. Maybe doesn't this kind of prove everything that Trump has said or claimed about the establishment that it's working against him, that it's trying to prevent his policies, that it's like holding on to all these neoliberal policies that um, he's been uh, falsely running on, rebelling against. Like I feel like this is just going to give him maybe more wind in his sails among people who are sick of the status quo. They're gonna they're gonna look at the Democrats as these bureaucrats in in Washington that don't care about America, et cetera, et cetera. Like that's what mm. I worry about anyway. I don't know if that's how it like translates in America, but it's just it's a it to me this, this is like a very expensive ordeal that yeah. um was like a show trial from the beginning. You know because there was a, a Democratic majority in Congress and there was mm -hmm. a Republican in Senate, so it's never actually like unless some something crazy happens which i don't imagine i there's no way the republicans are turning on their own like yeah. it, it just seems like this giant symbolic thing that i don't know if the democrats are on the right side of just in the zeitgeist sense no and and you're so right about well, i mean we'll see what happens in the senate but it is a republican majority and i think i i saw this really funny uh tweet kind of simplifying this and it said in this instance, uh, impeachment is you and your homegirls having all the evidence that your man is cheating, but to break up with him, you got to convince a jury of his frat brothers who were there during the <laughs> cheating that your man is a cheater. And I was like, okay, that's a good tweet. That's a good simplification. <laughs> yeah. I, I saw some, some arguments that the Senate trial, because the, the rules for a, a Senate trial of the an impeached president like they're not written anywhere in the constitution really they're extremely vague and and the rules can sort of just be set as you go um and i started this argument that no uh, nancy pelosi could demand that the senate trial would have to have anonymous voting um which would allow for the republican senators who don't like Trump, but also don't want to lose their careers to actually vote to remove Trump from office. Hmm. Um, but she she never attempted to do that, and I don't really know why. Um, but so so the the voting is going to be public. Uh, I assume one or two Republicans, Mitt Romney being one of them, is going to vote to remove, uh, but the rest are not going to have the balls to do it because they don't want to, if they do, you know, all their colleagues going to know that they voted against the sitting Republican president and they're going to be out of a job. Um, their party might kick them out. They're not going to be reelected next term or next election. Yeah. See, I you, you have more hope than me. I, I don't think someone <laughs> like Mitt Romney would ever vote against Trump. No, he said that he's gonna. <sighs> I, he did. When did he say this? Uh, like a while ago, he, he was a shit talking Trump a bunch. He said that Trump should be impeached. Are you talking like during his, what was it, Utah election or whatever it was? No, it wasn't too long ago, was it? Am I, am I mixing him up with another Republican? I, d I don't know. I, d I just I don't felt like I saw an article or like a headline that was Mitt Romney promises to impeach Trump. Is he even a senator? <laughs> he is, right? Yeah, of of Utah, yeah. 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 Let's see. Three Republicans oh, yeah, are open to impeachment witnesses, but Democrats need Four is what I'm hearing a lot of. Mm. But I think, I think, yeah, that Romney is in support of, of getting him out. Yeah, which was 
surprising, but I guess Mitt Romney is more of a I don't know what you would call Romney. I mean, he's like a he's like a pre-Trump Republican, if that makes sense. I don't know, maybe like he, he's Romney one wants of the, a chance at the White House again. <laughs> he definitely so? does, yeah. Well, yeah, he ran oh. against Obama in what was it? 2012, I think it was. Yeah, yeah 2012 because I remember those Romney memes were fire. Not like in support of him, but like the relatable Romney <laughs> memes. Where he was just like, oh, yeah, my family, we support the American car industry. My wife drives four Bentleys. Oh. Like, <laughs> yeah, all this stuff about his horse, his racehorse, and strapping his dog to the roof of his car and stuff. That was a crazy time. <laughs> that, was, that was a good time for memes. Um, but, yeah, maybe, mm. maybe he wants another run at the White House himself. I think a lot of mm. the other Republicans are, like you guys mentioned, are probably going to be a little bit more cowardly with their vote because it might compromise their jobs. Maybe yeah. they see, you know, the revolving door that is Trump's presidential cabinet. They're like, oh, yeah, I'll have a shot next time <laughs> around. Maybe I could probably make it. Fucking Alex Jones. That was that really felt like out of nowhere. Who like, saw all that of a coming? sudden there was no more Alex Jones on YouTube? Yeah. Who saw that coming? Alex Jones being deplatformed. That was that was what the fuck am I going to watch now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would say Stephen Molyneux, but even he had this uh, video put out recently where he was, he kind of sounded really defeated and he's like, what am I supposed to do? Like, I don't have my normal <laughs> income anymore. Like, you think I can, you know, go back into the corporate world? One Google search and I'm, I'm finished. And it's like, oh yeah, yeah. those are the consequences of your fucking <laughs> actions. <laughs> we talked yeah. about that in the last episode, actually, with the philosophy tube. Oh. Um, who, well, you said something, Peter, about how he could never really return to work in academia because there's sort of this unspoken rule that you're not supposed to be open about your political opinions. And if you Google his name, you find a YouTube channel where he talks about, you know, leftism. Well, it's, it's, I might have, I might have phrased it incorrectly, but there is definitely a trend in academia which points to if you are an outspoken, uh, ideological person, you're less likely to get grants. Um, mm. Like that happens to people right. like Jordan Peterson, but it also happens to to Marxists, like people who mm. are politically active on the left wing, or not even Marxists, socialists, or people who've run for office or whatever. Like if they return to academia and they have this high profile, universities are terrified of bad press. Mm -hmm. Essentially, yeah. they don't want controversy, so they they are very conservative with who they give uh, research money to. So yeah, this whole, I don't know, have you heard about this whole ContraPoints thing, Sabrina? Um, I mean, I follow ContraPoints on YouTube. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, she was, she was canceled uh, by oh. Twitter, by this angry mob on Twitter um, for a bunch of reasons that we don't have to get into. But uh, what's happened is not only, like, sh she's being attacked around the clock for um, doing or like s saying something that, that these people don't like, but also mm -hmm. all these people like in the orbit of ContraPoints have mm -hmm. been kind of like forced to, or, you know, have been threatened indirectly to state whether or not they support ContraPoints because they've worked with ContraPoints in the past or referenced ContraPoints. So they're considered like, uh, uh, people who have stood by idly if they don't go out and say something, um, mm. about ContraPoints. So you have all these people that, uh, could potentially have their career ruined for not condemning this person that they know and are friendly with. It's a pretty terrifying situation. And I feel like that whole movement is kind of spreading to all parts of, of culture, not just online celebrities, but also people like Bernie Sanders or mm -hmm. um, like just yeah. people in general mm -hmm. who speak out. Like there's, there's this uh, giant vigilante guard standing by on Twitter and, <laughs> and social media who are just waiting for you to, 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 to have the wrong opinion. And then they gather and uh, threaten you and everyone you know, which is mm. horrifying. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and I... So welcome. Her, her <laughs> most recent video regarding, uh, like, cancel culture, I think I've... It's definitely one of the heftier ones. I, I got about three-fourths of the way through. And I do just want to say, like, right off the bat that, you know, I do support Natalie. Um, I don't think that she deserves to be canceled i mean essentially also like in terms of like the twitter cancelers they didn't really cancel her i mean she's still doing what she's doing on youtube and yeah maybe she doesn't tweet as much oh no she doesn't she uh left twitter yeah i think her she's not on twitter um, at all now her twitter is still up but she it's has run left by it somebody forever. else now right 
No, it's not Ron at all. It's, it's oh really? Not tweeting I thought anything. she had somebody else on it. Okay. No, well maybe. I don't. I don't think so though. No, that person quit. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's a real thing that happened. Yeah, the person. Really? There was some person. Yeah, there was some person that uh, she hired to t- tend to her Twitter. Yeah. And that person had like a, a a mental breakdown from all the hate and had to quit. Jesus. Hmm. Yeah, no, that it's it's really scary. Like if you read on if you read on Twitter some of the things that people still to this day tweet at Natalie, it's horrific. No, yeah, it's when terrifying. she dropped that video, I just you know I went to Twitter. She started trending, and a lot of it was just so hateful, and I think a little misguided. Um, so I closed that very quickly, and I'm happy that mm. if being off of Twitter is you know helping her, you know it's just Twitter. It's not necessary. Um, yeah. but I, I do hope for the best for her. No, yeah. but I, like I was definitely getting, uh, Vietnam war flashbacks, seeing how <laughs> Twitter turned on, well, not turned like they already didn't like Bernie, but how these like neoliberals and, and Warren stands, yeah. um, started going after Bernie. Like mm-hmm. they definitely had the, the m- m- canceling mob vibe. Like they were. They were ready to, to cancel Bernie, you know, end him, like uh, brand him as a sexist, and never speak of him again. Luckily, though, I, th- I think it backfired pretty heavily, and I actually think mm-hmm. Warren dropped in. Like Warren didn't gain anything from doing that whole thing. No, if anything, I do think that she kind of dropped in the polls after that because I think after the fact. Um, a lot of people recognized that the tactics from her campaign in the last week were just um, kind of baseless and, no. you know, kind of kind of skeezy in terms of, like, uh, colluding with CNN, you know, knowing that she has a hot mic on and as soon as the oh, debate yeah. is over, when, <laughs> when, you know, she validated that inappropriate question regarding Bernie, where it's like, Bernie, did you say this? No, I did not. Okay, Warren, how did you feel when Bernie said this? Like, dude, <laughs> so not only did she validate it by saying, I disagree, but as soon as the debate was over, she made a beeline straight for Bernie, knowing that her mic was hot and said, did you call me a liar on national TV? And Bernie was just so taken aback. Like, what? Yeah. And I, luckily, he realized that this was at an attempt at a gotcha moment. Um, so he backed away, um, you know, very quickly. But... I think a lot of people recognize that these tactics are are just that they're they're pretty negative uh, tactics from the Warren campaign, and I think that's why we saw such a huge drop not only in her polls, but we saw the hashtag refund Warren trending, mm-hmm. and people were you know requesting their donations back from the Warren campaign to the point where people were posting screenshots of you know their email to act blue which is you know the donation service and act blue would respond with sorry we're experiencing a high number of emails regarding this issue at the moment like you know please be patient Hmm. so i'm sure it definitely put a big dent in her yeah but also it it seemed like like she didn't she hasn't apologized for it or really gone back or She's like, told her supporters not to to mention it anymore. I think is the, oh, okay. the ultimate outcome. I yeah, hope so. but but not publicly. Hmm. Just uh, in like an email to her to her workers to not not take it any further. Essentially, yeah. which yeah. is as big of an omission as you could probably get from a political candidate. Hmm. So we've, we've talked a bit about the election and the primaries, and of course, I think I think we would all. Well, actually, Peter, you are a bit skeptical about whether or not Trump is gonna win. Because I have a bet yes. with you. I've bet yes. with you that Trump is going to lose, and you've bet that yeah. Trump is going to win. Yeah, unfortunately, I think he's, he's going to be reelected. Yeah. What do you think, Sabrina? <laughs> I, I got to have hope. I have to have hope. Otherwise, what, what are we going to do? Mm. Drown against the tide? We, yeah, I, I do think that Bernie is going to win the nomination. I think he's going to win uh, and become our next president. I, I have a lot of faith. Hmm. I, I think you absolutely need faith, and that's the most important thing. And whenever people ask me about, about thinking that 
Trump is going to be reelected, I always say, please prove me wrong. Yeah. <laughs> because I really don't want him to be reelected. I think he's awful and he's an awful influence on the world. Mm. So I just please take it as motivation to go and do what Sabrina's doing do phone banking, volunteer, be active because it really does matter. You change people's minds, you have an influence on how the world is run. Uh, but we need a lot of people to do it, yeah. essentially. And and we're not allowed to, obviously, and we can't physically. <laughs> so do it for us. Like, uh, <laughs> why not? <laughs> we do have a lot of American listeners. I think most of our listeners actually are American. Uh, but Oh, cool. But also most of our, well, not most, but a good chunk of our listeners are like 16 or 17. <laughs> um <laughs> Well, yeah, and I mean, even if you are, even if you're not of voting age, you can still volunteer, right? You can pass out leaflets or whatever. I'm sure. Can you? Yeah, so do that. <laughs> uh, but I, I was thinking about if Bernie were to win and if Bernie were to become inaugurated as president, what that would actually look like. Um, I mean, obviously. Uh, on, on on the left, on, on like the far left in the circles where we circulate, um, there are those who are uh, who are skeptical that Bernie would ever actually be able to implement anything. Um, that essentially, if Bernie were to become president, then maybe he would, you know, he could do a few executive orders. But I think Bernie is the kind of person who would kind of restrain himself from doing too many executive orders and congress might a lot of the time vote down his proposals and also i mean also just on the international stage he would be it would just be very refreshing to have a president of the u.s who would be more diplomatic and not a war hawk <laughs> but i don't what are, did did obama before he was elected did he did he talk about peace and not going to war at all well i'm the old person yeah I'm the old person. You're, you're the old i can person. i can answer this <laughs> uh, no okay. he didn't talk about it uh he talked about uh how there isn't a blue america or a red america there's the united mm. states of america mm. and when we stand together we can accomplish great things etc etc uh let's end the war in iraq and afghanistan he said but he didn't like he yeah, also said to keep the, the the national like the, the the safety of america and the national interests of america mm. safe abroad mm. which meant like i would go to war if it was necessary yeah. like that type of very much like what biden is saying right now mm. yeah and he also promised to close guantanamo but i mean i don't entirely blame him for not doing that because congress was really mm. against him on that one but Mm. Not initially, though he could have. Yeah, he, he, he probably could have if he applied <laughs> himself a bit more. He had he had a super majority <laughs> for two years, and he didn't uh, he didn't close Guantanamo. Not yeah, but mm, yeah, it's depressing. I mean, yeah, he did try to end well uh, to normalize relations with Cuba, um, and it it you know it went well for a while, and then Trump was elected, and he instantly reversed everything Obama had done. That is something that I'm hopeful that Bernie would do, though, is normalize relations with Cuba and, and the embargo. Because the the embargo against Cuba is really hurting not the government, mm -hmm. but the people. <laughs> the Cuban economy is developing, but really not at the pace that the Cuban people need it to. Um, and I mean, it's, it's the same with, with embargoes and sanctions in Iran and North Korea and... and Everywhere else, the U.S. puts some embargoes. You know, it never hurts the government. It always hurts mm -hmm. the people. I'm cautiously optimistic that Bernie will win the primary. I think if Bernie wins the primaries, I actually do think that he will beat Trump. I think Bernie is the one candidate who could do it. Uh, and also, um, not to advocate gambling, <laughs> uh, but if you are a gambling person and you believe Bernie's going to win, now is the time to put your money down. <laughs> <laughs> you can get some very good odds on Bernie winning. I'll bet on Bernie. <laughs> well, we thank you very much for for coming on, Sabrina. Yeah, you guys, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's so it's so fun to uh, to talk politics that's not on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No. Honestly, thank you so much. It really is like a, a godsend. Like you're you're a wonderful person, and we we <laughs> love talking to you. And it's also just wonderful to have someone who is like in the thick of it in the Bernie campaign. <laughs> To talk yeah. about it because it's obviously something that we're reading a lot about and 
that's going on at the moment. So it's really just... Thank you so much, guys. Anytime. Thank you to our patrons, Joshua Cheesman, Dunk Chunk Funk, O.C. Sapo Kitty, Roland Badeland, M. Lim, Yen Chan Min, Will M., Alfie Bridge Smith, Emil Sigerbeck, Quagram, John H. N., and Jedi Davian. Thank you very much for your contributions.